of the smoke here is if we can do things that are you know fun and not change behaviors but kind of augment existing behaviors we can see success hello and welcome to growth masterminds my name of course is john Kitz here today we're chatting with Bo button he's the ceo and cto of atlas reality our focus today is location-based gaming. That's a kind of a newly hot category. Everybody knows Pokemon Go, which is still an ongoing massive success. But Niantic, the studio behind Pokemon Go, is now also releasing NBA All World. I'm getting ads for that all over the place right now, which they say turns the real world into a basketball theme park. You can meet stars everywhere. Atlas Reality is in some sense doing a more modern take. They're building a metaverse on top of the real world. There's the M word. Welcome, Bo. Glad to have you on Growth Masterminds. Thanks for having me. Just one slight correction. President and CTO. Sami, my partner, is the oh. CEO. Don't want to steal anybody's thunder, but we're good. Yeah. CTO I'm going to blame you for that mistake because LinkedIn, I'm pretty sure, says CEO, but you know what? I may have misread it. It's oh, early. It's all but... right. It's all right. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you, sir. Looking forward for the conversation. Awesome. That is excellent. Hey, talk about the state of location-based apps. Where are we in that evolution? I mean, to be quite blunt, you know, it's, it's not for everybody. Uh, you know, there's an element of physical activity that you have to subscribe to. You have to move about. Um, when Pokemon Go initially came out, I think, A, the IP Pokemon drove that initial audience, but it was a younger audience. Um, there was a lot of motivation to go out early on and like do things you weren't already doing. Like, you know, I had friends, grown friends who were like, I'm going to go to the park today and walk around. I'm like, <laughs> are you okay? Check your blood pressure. Like something's not right. But they were very eager to go collect or go to a gym or like, like a, a virtual gym in Pokemon. Yeah. The real yep, gym. Which I is remember. Where we all should probably be. But you know, it's, it's, it's not a genre that I think is going to like sweep the entire gaming industry. Obviously it's for the folks who like geocaching, the folks who, you know, feel like they can incorporate a game into their already existing, like real everyday tasks. I'm going to the grocery store. I'm going to get gas. I'm going to the pharmacy. And what we've kind of like, I think, seen through kind of like the, the, the smoke here is if we can do things that are, you know, fun and not change behaviors, but kind of augment existing behaviors, we can see success and we find success. And that's what we've done. But yeah, the state of it is, is it's in its infancy, even with Pokemon Go and the six or seven other large IPs, we had Harry Potter. There was another one that Nintendo came out with. It's a cute little game. I can never remember its name, but you know, it's not it's not as big as I think it's going to be. But I also don't think it's going to be massive. It's not going to like take over the gaming industry, the mobile gaming industry. Well, that makes sense. I mean, and that startling humility from <laughs> somebody in this space. But yes, I mean, there, there are many different types of gaming, right? And not everybody's going to go out. I do. I think I still have Pokemon Go on my phone. I would have to double check. Maybe iOS has deleted it for me because I haven't played it in forever. But yes. I do remember traveling and like being in New York and, oh, what's here? And are there some Pokemon there? And, you know, I didn't get super deep into it and train my Pokemon and all that stuff. But it is it is cool. The the other element that you're bringing in is layering on virtual realities over actual physical reality. And that's interesting from a couple of aspects, right? I mean, that's interesting because we've seen maybe for some years now, the, the, the thinking that we can overlay mm, multiplayer games in sort of a, a virtual reality that is in the real world, you know, and kind of shooting and then seeing where people are shooting and, and that sort of thing. What kind of gameplay are you building into your metaverse on top of the real world? Yeah. So look, when I saw the initial like laser tag that was location based, yep. I fell in love with the idea and I experimented with it. And I very quickly realized that this will probably never come to fruition. There's just too many technical obstacles and inconveniences. The user experience is terrible, but like from a technologist perspective, my brain was like, holy shit, this is amazing. This is what I need to be doing. I got to pause you there for a second because that is an incredibly smart comment because all the demos look out of this world. All the demos look insane and I want to do it. And I think it's amazing. And then I think about playing while holding this up in front of my We face. call that gorilla arm. It's not dissimilar to people who say that touchscreens are amazing. 
try using a touchscreen monitor for eight hours to do your day job. You will hate it. So the same concept applies with Pokemon Go as well, is throwing a Pokeball in AR, holding your phone up, after a while it becomes a chore. So mm -hmm. in, in Atlas Realities games, we've abandoned that classical interpretation of augmented reality where you're seeing things that are superimposed, like three-dimensional models in reality. And what we refer to as, as, as AR is what you just described, which is this virtual layer that's superimposed geospatially. So we're not talking about characters running around on the map. It's, it's a map that is a real map, a real map. So if you open up Google Street View or Google Maps and open up our game, you'll see the same roadways and things like that. But the buildings and structures that you'll see in our world aren't really there. So that's the augmentation that we refer to. But yeah, going back to the other technology showpieces or showcases, I love them. But every time I've gone to CES and had an opportunity to play with it, I'm like, I just don't see this as going to like, I, I, there's too many things. There's just too many things and obstacles you have to work through. And someone might succeed, but even then the audience I feel like is very small. So I don't know how you can actually commercialize that and, and be successful with it. I think that if and when we get really good smart glasses that are super light and stick to your face while you're doing them <laughs> very yeah. crazy things, that might be incredible. But I, I, I tend to agree, while this is our primary, I'm holding my phone here, while that's our primary mode of seeing augmented reality, um, it's tough to do that. Now talk about the real world component here. Um, how did you build in the mapping and have you mapped every square centimeter, square inch of the earth's surface uh, in your game? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a big fan as the, the, the person who drives like the technology vision. Most people who, when they envision a technologist, they envision this guy who likes to work in a dark room, who likes inventing algorithms. I'm not that guy. I, I exist in user space. So admittedly, we stand on the shoulders of giants. We did not invent our own mapping tech. I looked at what was already commercially available or open source, and we're leveraging the same technology that any web-based map that you use today to navigate your car or whatever it is using. So that wasn't really the technical challenge for us. Now, there's there's plenty of geospatial related technical challenges, but um, the entire globe is mapped. Um, we partnered with a company called Mapbox. Um, there's probably 200 different map vendors, Google being probably the biggest. I know Microsoft has Bing Maps and then Apple has Apple Maps, but uh, Mapbox was kind of a, a neutral partner in that space. And uh, they have some software development kits that allowed us to really render maps in a video game with, with very little work, the, the initial spatial data. Now, everything on top of that is ours. But yeah, we've got the entire globe mapped. Um, right now, we're only available. The, the, the game that uh, is, is our largest success, Atlas Earth, is only available in the U.S., but we do plan on rolling that out. But that, that groundwork has already been laid, thankfully, because of that partnership. I love how that 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 you called a neutral partner. <laughs> Apple, of course, Man, has a big foot in mobile. Google oh has a gosh. big foot in mobile. So <laughs> I, it's so it's look. If I listen to like a keynote from a GDC or a, not a GDC, a Google conference or a Microsoft conference, like they're inventing amazing things. But every product that they've built and released, if you're not paying an arm for it, you're the product, and there's vendor lock in. And, and for some things, you just have no choice. Like if you're building an Android app, you're going to use Android Studio. You're going to use the Android ecosystem, and you're not going to really have many other options. Now, there's some cross-platform solutions, but Google also is the winner in that space. So like no matter what you do, there's some element of vendor lock-in. So I tried where it made sense to have neutral partners, and Mapbox was pretty much the only third-party mapping solution that didn't have, you know, a, a, a hand in the device or the operating system. They're like, we don't care about that. We monetize differently. Let's talk about users and growth. Um, you've got a play to earn uh, methodology. You've, you're, you're, you're building in um, virtual space over real space where people actually earn actual cash, not crypto, actual cash. Talk about play to earn and how you chose that and how that's working for you. Honestly, when we started the initial conceptualization of this game, the play to earn and, and I think more politically correct or acceptable today is not play to earn, it's play and earn. The, the ah. idea of playing to earn, well, that could be a fun <laughs> job. And 
we don't want to build things that, you know, that it's called don't. work. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, thankfully in my profession as an engineer, like I, I it's play to earn. Like that's exactly yes. right. I get to experiment and do exploratory work, but I would say the play and earn is where we fall. And that's a relatively new term, new two years, something like that. But, uh, you know, we are off chain, so there's no blockchain web three tie ins. There's no cryptocurrencies. Um, I can't divulge how the, the, the back office works, but it's pretty simple. We earn money from selling virtual real estate, so that's revenue. We serve ads. They're incentivized video ads, so they're not forced upon the user. We reward them for watching an ad. So you're exchanging your time for a reward. Now, generally, we get paid in cash for that time, and then what we're mm -hmm. able to do behind the scenes is we've got an actuarian model where we actually have we, – we, we pay you in virtual rent. So, again, because we're not – a fintech product. We're not regulated. This is not an investment platform. This is a video game. So we can't say things like return. There is no investment. Mm -hmm. There's no securities. There's no guarantees. But in essence, you're converting your time. We're generating revenue. And what we're doing in exchange for that time is paying you in virtual rent that your land accrues. And then once you get to $5 in virtual rent, you can cash it out into your, your checking account through PayPal right now. Right now, that's mm -hmm. kind of the Achilles heel is we only partner with PayPal. We're looking at, I think we've got one lined up so you can cash out to your checking account or Venmo because that's, if you go on Facebook, that's a hot topic. I don't have PayPal. That's so old school. But yeah, that's basically what we do is you, you play the game, you buy real estate, you compete to own the most land in a city to become the mayor. Same thing for the state, you become the governor or the country, the president. Um, and that's probably the from a game loop perspective, the most competition right now is they want the title. They want the, the clout. They want to be recognized because the minute you open the game, if you're in Texas, you see the governor of Texas, you see the president of the U.S., and you see the mayor of the city you're in. So your profile could be in front of right now we're at 1.5 million users, not in Austin, Texas, where I am. But there's enough people there where if that's your thing, if clout is your thing, it's pretty attractive. Very, very cool. That made me think a little bit of Foursquare and Swarm, which I still use. Maybe that's super old school, but I'm kind of, you know, sometimes there's sort of quantified self types of things. I do check in and then I can see where I was over the past see, year well, and stuff like that. Foursquare was kind of the inspiration for our passport. So in the game, we have a passport book. So when you travel, you can buy the badge for the city that you're in, the state that you're in, or the, the country that you're in. Uh, what's interesting is if you're the mayor of the city or the, the, the governor of the state or the president of the country, when someone buys that badge, in essence, the revenue we get – now, this is virtual uh, – the in-game currency is called Atlas Bucks. So we sell these things for Atlas Bucks. What we do is the, the person who holds that title gets a share of the proceeds from that. So that's the other motivation to become the mayor, the governor, or the president. Because if it's a hot – let's say it's New York, New York, you're going to see a lot of tourists. You're going to see a lot of bad sales. Therefore, at the end of the day, when we do a cash out, you make – you can make two, three hundred Atlas books by just basically being the mayor. So that's passive income in the game. And then you can buy more land and so on and so forth. But, yeah, it works the same way. You buy the badge. We show you the actual passport. And that's that's another competitive element because people are just again, it's clout. I mean, I yep. I don't relate to that. I hate that aspect of the Internet, quite frankly. Like I'm not the Instagram <laughs> guy who's sharing all of this stuff. But there are a lot of people, unfortunately, more than likely, mostly millennials that are just like they want a voice. They want to say, hey, I've been to 300 you know, locations, et cetera. And I have the badge. This is humanity. Yes. <laughs> this is no, people. Uh, I, I am, you I'm have committed multiple. to not changing that, but I'm committed. <laughs> my, my, my partner and I are as well. Like there, there needs to be more things to do in this game because right now it seems to be the core game loop is you buy land, you become a title holder, and then you can basically brag about it. The goal here is to really <laughs> allow people to genuinely earn a meaningful passive income to some degree. It's a metaverse aristocracy. Wow. Oh, it's, yeah. it's <laughs> Talk about growth. Um, you said you're at 1.5 million users right now. How are you growing? I'd say the majority of our user acquisition channels are paid opportunities. Um, we have an in-house creative team. My partner and our CEO, Sami, his background's in user acquisition. He comes from the fintech space. He worked with, uh, I think he was chief user acquisition officer at Acorns, which is a kind of a roundup I know them. investment yep. platform. Um, he was an early employee there. He was also uh, there's a company called Honey where he kind of like cut his teeth on how to like, you know, this whole uh, coupon clipping like strategy thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the core of this is 
he's taken what he learned in those industries and we're applying it here, but most of it is paid. We do see some organic, we're not viral yet. It's not mainstream, but most of what we're doing is going to be paid. We're on pretty much every social media network other than LinkedIn, because that's not our target audience. But uh, TikTok is pretty, you know, fruitful for us. Obviously, Facebook, I can't, I don't know the percentages, but like every time we talk, like the Facebook audience network, like Facebook is big. Um, mm -hmm, I hate mm -hmm. the fact that it drives so much of our, you know, our, our, our user acquisition, but <laughs> it is what it is. You got to go where the people are and where the tools are because the yep. tooling that they have is, I remember 10 years ago playing with Facebook ads and it was pretty rudimentary. Now it's, it's, it's amazing. Like you could say, I need people like I can target us. I, I want people that don't have hair who live here. I'm like, Oh my God, this is crazy. <laughs> we share the same barber. Uh, oh yeah, exactly. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> Same here, same here. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is interesting. Um, obviously, Google and Facebook are going to be top of the list for most people who are doing paid user acquisition. Uh, it is interesting here, TikTok, they have absolutely crushed it, not just in time spent and, and users acquired and installs, but also they've really upped their game for ad tools, backend ad tools yeah, as no, well. It's, it's weekly I get an email from their advertising platform about improvements, either new API endpoints, new ways to slice their data. Um, we're, I think in the last four months, we started running on TikTok. For the longest, they wouldn't let us run our ads because if you don't know how our business works, this could look like a sweepstakes or it could look like yep. some type of lottery thing. So we had to actually get legal opinions from our attorneys and work with their team to actually explain how we work so then we could get you know approval to run ads. Um, and that was a nightmare. But yeah, TikTok is... Again, I'm not a fan of TikTok. As a parent of three, our, like, my youngest is 10. She's a teen for all intents and purposes. I hate it. I absolutely hate TikTok. <laughs> I've probably deleted TikTok about six times. <laughs> and no, then I get people who share links that only work in the TikTok app. And I install it, I'll watch it, and then I uninstall it. Like I'm that disciplined <laughs> because I know what will happen. I'll find myself laying in bed at midnight, and I'll probably doom scroll for six hours. And I'm like, I, I just lost that time of my life. I just, I'm that kind of person. Yeah, exactly. So you got to do what you got to do. Talk a little bit about non-blockchain Web3. I mean, you've got um, a play and earn methodology. Thank you for that tip. <laughs> you've also got this sort of virtual real estate and virtual ownership or actual ownership in some sense of virtual spaces. Uh, so you've got some Web3 components, but you're not blockchain. Talk about why. Yeah, so I've been following, you know, blockchain since its infancy, uh, Bitcoin specifically, before we had this programmable model that, that Ethereum brought to the table with yep. EVM. Like it was you had BTC, that was it. It was just a, a security. You could trade it. And, okay, great. This is the future. It's a replacement for gold. But the Ethereum virtual machine kind of opened up uh, Pandora's box, like programmability, smart contracts, et cetera. And I was like, this is cool. Now, unfortunately, at some point, there were a lot of opportunists that took advantage of that and started leveraging NFTs for things that I think are absolutely useless. So I've always looked at the blockchain as nothing more than like an evolution of a database. We use different database technologies, document DBs, et cetera. Like there's so many different things or different technologies. I've never looked at it as like, this is the future. It's just another tool that's available for me to use if the, the, the features it provides are features that I need to implement something. And I was inspired by not only the blockchain on how it worked, but some of the games that were built on top of the blockchain. But I wasn't convinced that it was ready for mainstream because user the, the onboarding flow for Web3, getting a wallet, remembering where to put your keys. Is it a, you know, a custodial wallet, a non-custodial wallet? Is it a hardware wallet? Those are not terms that are easily digestible by average gamers. And, you know, our, our success, most of our success has been found because we've I think perfected the first time user experience. You get in, we hook you, you start playing. You can't do that when you have to remember a 16 word mnemonic phrase. Like I, it's a nightmare. So, you know, again, the reason we didn't go blockchain, there was a, a day where my partner and I were like on the fence, you know, flip a coin, mm -hmm. do we go that way or do we not? And I did a little bit more homework and I said, let's, let's use it as an inspiration. Let's, 
what what do players get from Web3 and its ownership and equity? You know, uh, my partner is the one who kind of internally said Web1 was access to knowledge. Web2 was access to people. Web3 was access to some type of equity or skin in the game. You've got Facebook making billions of dollars and you're the currency. You're not making anything. So we kind of took that and said, well, what do they want? They want money. They want something that has value, not just an NFT on the blockchain just to prove that you own a character. They want something that they can convert into something that's extremely useful. And ideally, that would be cash. So we chose not to bring it on chain because of, again, the first time user experiences. But we brought all of the things that we thought that the on chain games and Web3 was bringing to the, the, you know, kind of the, the Internet into the game. And we didn't need blockchain. Um, mm-hmm. Now, that's not to say at some point in the future we don't have a dovetail into blockchain like an off ramp where you can take your virtual rent and convert it to ethereum or some other crypto because we do see a lot of our players who earn cash they cash out and go to coinbase all right Mm -hmm. well look we're Mm -hmm. missing out on that we could have Mm -hmm. an exchange Mm -hmm. we could have a wallet we could let you do that in our own ecosystem and participate in that spread so those are the Mm -hmm. kind of things that we're thinking about but yeah right now off chain for those reasons could it be that Web3 is more about an ethos and an idea or a set of ideas than one particular technology? Uh, that's I, an I interesting so. concept. Yeah that's, yeah, that's kind of where I'm going. Well, Bo, this has been a pleasure to chat. It's cool to investigate the location-based gaming space once again. And you were born in new orleans and that just clicked Bo, new orleans that makes a lot of sense (laughs) thank you for taking this time do appreciate it